Hey Pleasant Hill, how you doing out there? It's Easter weekend, hope it's a glorious time for you as well. I could yell, he is risen, and you could yell, he is risen indeed, and we could wake the neighbors up that way, but just keep it in your mind that we know Jesus is risen. Excited about that fact, no matter where we are. Hey, to let you know, we did launch a new website this week. You got a little blurb about that on your phone, I think, earlier. Uh, make sure you realize that uh, there's a tab on that website, too, for sermons. So if you're having trouble jumping through the steps to find the YouTube channel, this is easy. Go to www.pleasanthill.cc and you will find a little sermon tab on top. When you click that, it'll take you right to the whole thing. Also, Kyle's been doing all the film work, of course, for the uh, um, sermons and stuff on YouTube. He's going to change it a little bit so when you open that link, you'll have the announcements, the message, and the community meditation all run together on one uh, item. So when you click that, it's all right there together continuously. So I think you'll like that a little easier as well. Don't forget, though, to go back to the YouTube channel, hit the playlist to get those worship songs picked up for the week as well. Don't forget to do that and get your heart right and just enjoy a little time with the music and the Word of God for sure. Great stuff there. Uh, it is Easter Sunday. We mentioned last week we had some stuff for the kids. There were some... Uh, Easter helpers running around delivering resurrection eggs to houses. We've got a couple uh, cartons left over. If you have children in the hill climbers group, fifth grade and under, we may have missed. Sorry about that. We worked real hard trying to identify everybody, but if we missed you, let me know. We've got a couple of these left, and we could make those available to you pretty cheaply. And uh, like three easy payments on QVC channel here, we can get them out to your house pretty easy. So let me know if you need some of those. All right. Uh, just one prayer request this week, and that would be Linda Baxter's cousins. We mentioned those on the uh, prayer chain earlier this week. Uh, Linda has two cousins, husband and wife down in Wood River, who have both been affected by the COVID-19 virus, and they would sure appreciate your prayers as well. Okay. Uh, birthdays, uh, I need to catch up with a couple I missed last week. Uh, last week, uh, Caitlin Wiedekamp and Quinn Hammond celebrated their birthdays, and they missed my list. This week, on Thursday, Ben Matley will have a birthday. And then on Friday, Ramsey Wiedekamp celebrates. And on Saturday, then, Connie Pickerel turns another year older. So if you see those folks out and about, make sure you give them a high and happy birthday wishes. Now, on Today, Easter Sunday, with all the other celebrations going on, we have one anniversary today, and that's Ben and Jacqueline Matley. We wish them the best and many more years to come. Now, again, I always say we try to get these birthdays, anniversaries, or missed years. Let me know. We'll give you a shout-out next week for sure and make sure you're on my calendar. All right? Hey, I just want to slide over here a little bit. Um, check out the elephant in the room. We've got a few cans of gravy. We've got some plates ready. And normally this little fellowship hall is buzzing this morning. Easter is a big deal here at Pleasant Hill. We celebrate like crazy. Of course, the risen Savior is an awesome thing to celebrate. And we take full advantage of that to get the church family together. And we usually feed about 400 people today. So we got the gravy here. It was bought a month or so ago. We may get to come back and have biscuits or gravy one day yet. That's for sure. Looking forward to that day. Oh, yeah. Wait. Check out my hams. I got big hams too. Think you're gonna like those, aren't you? So, looking forward to getting together with you guys real soon someday. There is a certain emptiness here in the church for sure. I'm sure you guys are feeling as well, missing our church family, missing our time to get together. Luckily, we can worship via the internet right now, but still, there is an emptiness here. And we know that just as uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene felt that as they went to the tomb, that emptiness caught them off guard. And we are also being caught off guard right now. For the last month, it's been really different, really unusual for all of us. But we're looking forward to the fact that we can come back together again. And we know that Jesus gives us that reassurance. And that's an awesome thing. Just keep praying for the COVID virus to chase its way out of here. We know that God can take care of that as well. 
And uh, someday soon we'll be back in the church and bring this church building back to life. Right now, keep being the church where you are. Keep reaching out to your neighbors and all your friends. Get ready to enjoy a fabulous Easter message from Preacher Dave. He's up right after me. Thank you much. Have a great week. Well, thank you, Darren. Happy Easter, everyone. We all come from empty buildings uh, with uh, full hearts because of an empty tomb, and we celebrate then virtually together this Easter season. So happy Easter, everyone. I want to welcome you and uh, let you know it's an honor for letting us be part of your uh, 2020 Easter celebrations. You know, beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel uh, Jesus is going to take us to the other side and just can't wait like so many of you. I can't wait until we physically can be together having the true fellowship that Christ has made the church to have. And as we start with our message today, let's, let's start with prayer. Father, we do thank you and give you praise this Lord's Day, this Easter 2020. What a blessing is truly ours because of what you've given us and the gift of the resurrection of your son. We thank you for his passion, uh, his giving of his life for us, and for then uh, a life that was lived that would be rewarded then with a resurrection to new life, offering that to us in the, in the ability that we have then to live for you. We pray that you would open your word now. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to bring today to you, knowing we have all our family gathered together, uh, this way, and that we're in little families there at home, uh, a message that uh, we looked at a number of years ago that would involve then the whole the whole family. And, and would you imagine with me that this is a magic eraser, and that we could take a history book, and that we could pick a moment in time, we could go back, and that we could literally erase that moment from having ever occurred. Uh, what moment? Maybe this would be a good homeschool assignment this week, what moment in history would you erase? I think a good one that we would all want to erase right now is to go back to the start of this pandemic, to erase that. Does that sound good? Just imagine uh, how it would impact then our lives today and on even into the future. Would it make a difference? Well, you bet it would. Uh, Lives that would be regained, suffering that would be undone, jobs that could be restored. You know, if you want to measure the impact of something that happened in the past, then take a moment to imagine what life would be like if that event had never occurred. You do that and you begin to get a feel for the impact then, the importance of that event back then and then on into today. There's actually a branch of fiction writing that's known as alternative history. 
One of the great books in that genre is one entitled If It Had Happened Otherwise, written in 1931. There's essays, a collection of essays, and one of the chapters is written by the great British leader, Sir Winston Churchill. He asks the question and then answers it, what would life be like if Robert E. Lee had won the Battle of Gettysburg? And so many would believe that that was the turning point in the Civil War, so how would the U.S. be different today? Another essay in that book is one where the question is asked, what would have happened if John Wilkes Booth had missed when he shot at Abraham Lincoln. Another one would be, uh, what if Napoleon had won at the Battle of Waterloo? What would uh, Europe be like today? And so the idea is that you go back in time, you erase that moment, you look, then you imagine what the impact would be today and even on into the future. Let's look at the Easter account through that lens of that alternative history and ask ourselves the question, what would happen if there were no Easter? What would be different today if Jesus would never have been raised from the dead, if there was no resurrection? Essentially, that's the angle that the Apostle Paul imagines. Now, if you would grab your scriptures, uh, you know, or, or look, at, look it up on your device, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to spend a lot of time in there today. Beginning now at verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes this, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised. So let's imagine for a moment this Easter how things would be different today if Jesus had never risen from the dead. Well, I think simply we could start with there would be no hospitals today. It was the, the Christian community that started hospitals, caring for others, even well on into today, of course, we would not have, for us locally here, St. Francis Hospital in Litchfield would not exist. St. John's in Springfield would not exist today. Christians who care for others in the name of Jesus. I think you'd also have to, uh, you'd have to remove our, our schools, so many of our schools, from preschool on up to the universities, even the great universities, Harvard, Yale, uh, Princeton, uh, Notre Dame, all of these schools were established by Christians that wanted to teach others about the Bible and have them go out and to preach the good news. I think you'd have to also remove all benevolent missions, uh, orphanages, feeding programs, um, homeless shelters, uh, abroad, uh, foreign works. Imagine all those around the world that wouldn't exist because Christ had not rose from the dead, but also domestically, and speaking of domestically, there'd be a, you could make a really good case that the United States of America wouldn't even exist today. <clears throat> November 11th, 1620, on board the Mayflower, the uh, men and women on that uh, ship were anchored off of Provinceton Harbor, and they together, they, the pilgrims wrote then and signed, what is known to us today as the Mayflower Compact, stating that their purpose for establishing this nation was, quote now, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And so there would be no United States of America with all her influence over these past 400 years uh, here in our own nation and, and also then all around the world. Look now at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We would all still be in our sins. There'd be no basis for our faith. That would result in us not having uh, salvation. You say, but wait a minute. Didn't Jesus actually pay the price for our sins on the cross? Was it really necessary that Jesus rise from the dead for our sins to be forgiven? Well, the cross was the payment for our sins. But the resurrection, it validates that. It, it completes the transaction so that it, it makes it available for you and I to receive it. In other words, if Jesus had stayed dead, then he doesn't have power over life. Therefore, he can't offer it. He can't apply it then to our own lives to save us from our sins and from our own death. See, our sins result in death. We would still be uh, dead in our sins. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 1, he says this, As for you, 
You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's like when you're buying some, say some two by fours for a project you have there at home. And you know, you go to the counter there in your lumber yard, maybe for us it'd be RP lumber. We would uh, uh, go there, we would buy the materials. They would tell us to go back in your vehicle, go around back, go to building number two. You would pull up to a point, you would honk your horn. The yard man would come, he would ask you for what then? your receipt, right? Your receipt would show that and would prove that you have paid for this merchandise and you're ready then to receive it. The resurrection that we celebrate at Easter, it's like Jesus's receipt that we receive then from the Father. It proves that Jesus paid in full for the forgiveness that is to be ours now in Christ and the resurrection, it validates it. The resurrection is the proof of purchase it's the receipt. And so it gives us confidence in all the promises that come with being in Jesus. So if you erase Easter, I think another thing, as we think about this, forgiveness would just now be gone. We would still be dead in our sins. We would still have a bill that has to be paid. We would, uh, the punishment would have to still be um, uh, served. There would still be the guilt and the shame of our sin upon ourselves. If you erase Easter, you've got to also erase redemption. This is where uh, Jesus takes the broken pieces of our lives and he turns it into something beautiful uh, because now we have our sins forgiven, we're following after him, and he then makes a beautiful life out of us. With all of that then is the, the big blessing, the big gift then of grace. Grace would be gone. The unmerited gifting of God to us uh, yeah, regardless then uh, of something that we've earned. And so we would not have uh, to be able to be a recipient then of God's favor that comes uh, as a gift uh, from Christ. We'd also have to erase, if we erased Easter, we would then have to erase eternal life. That it would not be possible to have eternal life then in heaven with God. Christian author Philip Yancey, he tells of an unusual funeral experience that uh, he had one time. All the friends in the family, they gathered uh, around the body that was in a casket and uh, no songs were sung, no words were spoken. Uh, everyone was given as they came in, they were given a peppermint. And with that mint, when the cue came, they were to take that mint and begin sucking on it. And when that mint was completely dissolved, they were free to go. The, the time was over and uh, off to their cars, they all went. Uh, it's symbolic that this is the end, that this is it. Life has just dissolved away. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then that's pretty much the best that you could hope for. We live, we die, and then life just dissolves away. You erase Easter, you know you also then erase heaven. The golden streets there, no living forever in a place where there's no more crying, no more pain, no more death. Uh, all the reunions that we're looking forward to, I know you are, I am too, looking forward to the reunions to come in heaven for those who have died in Christ uh, as we then uh, live our lives out and wait for our departure that we might be reunited with them again. And uh, the ultimate healing of these bodies, we, uh, that would not take place if we didn't have heaven. If you erase Easter, ultimately, you erase all hope. All motivation for life, uh, purpose for life, all of that would be gone. Look at verse 17. We told, we're told that if Christ has been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Motivation is gone for living. Our purpose in life is gone for living. Look now at verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, people all around you would be watching. As they're watching you, they would realize that all the sacrifices that you've made in life, the battle that you have to live a holy life, your generosity, uh, the struggles, that you face, all those things that you do because Jesus has changed your life, 
They would see it as evidence that you've just wasted your time. You've wasted all your energy. You have wasted your life. You could have been spending uh, your whole life then on yourself. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you and I were, uh, are to be most pitied. Look now at verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also through, comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. See, no, no more plain alternative history. When we, uh, where we imagine what it would be like if Jesus has not been risen from the dead, because he is risen. Amen? Look now at verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. It had been prophesied that he was buried, then verse 4, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 other brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Check with them, he says, though some have fallen asleep. They have died. They've went to sleep then in Christ. No event in ancient history has been so documented as the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Not Plato, not Socrates, not um, uh, Michelangelo, not Leonardo da Vinci. We literally split all of history from before Jesus BC to all things after Jesus AD. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies in the old scripture. And so it gives validity then to what is written about him in the New Testament. And all the lives, just look at all the lives that have been changed, they continue to be changed. These are all reliable, uh, verifiable evidences that Jesus indeed has risen from the dead. And, and the Apostle Paul, he goes on to say, because Christ has indeed risen from the dead, this means something to us today. This gives us purpose. That gives us a direction to our lives. Look how he, he wraps up this, uh, this great chapter. Chapter 15, now look at verse 50. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters. So he's, he's been writing this whole time to the church. He's writing to the Christian. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives purpose to our lives. How we live our lives, who we live for, who we love and care for, what we do matters more than what we can ever imagine. And because Jesus has risen from the dead, Paul points out that we have victory over sin and death that Jesus has risen from the dead, we have hope. I love the way how Paul, he kind of trash talks death now because of the resurrection. Look at verse 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? We now have a hope that even death can't take away. And oh, it makes a difference in daily life and even at the end of life. I see all the time family and friends some, uh, th those who, who love Jesus, they know Jesus, they're, they're following after him every day. They have the hope of heaven. They be given a purpose in their lives. When the loved ones are suffering or when difficulties come, even when their loved one dies, they mourn, they grieve, 
but they know their loved one has just departed from this life. They have passed on to their home in heaven, having complete victory now over sin, over death, over the devil, over this world. And so they comfort one another. They encourage one another. They look forward to the reunion that will come with their loved one one day when they pass on into the presence of the Lord. And I also see all the time family and friends, those who do not know Jesus, they don't have the hope of heaven. They're not sure of their purpose in life, what life really, what purpose there is in life. And when one uh, is suffering or when one dies, they, they weep and they wail and, and they can't be comforted because their loved one now is no more. They're dumbfounded and they just want this all to be over. What's the difference? One grieves, but there's hope. The other is grieving because there is no hope. The difference between the two, it's Easter. Easter. The resurrection of Jesus that happened nearly 2,000 years ago makes all the difference today and forever. Death has been defeated. Jesus gives you the victory. And now we have hope. Now you have a purpose. Look at verse 58. Therefore, he writes, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's why we celebrate Easter. Two groups watching this video today. Those of you who know the power of the resurrection, you've experienced it in your lives. You know the difference that Jesus makes. And then there's those of you who have yet experienced who have yet to apply then what God has done for you in Jesus, in his death and his resurrection. You're living without God's grace. You're living without the forgiveness of your sins and you're living without hope. This Easter, Jesus offers God's grace to you that you can have hope then, that you can have a purpose for your life. You see, Easter seals these things for us. They can never be erased. So because of the resurrection, we have a purpose in our life, and it can't be erased. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what situation you face, you have a purpose. You have a direction. You could be in grade school. You can be uh, in a nursing home. And nothing the Bible tells us, nothing that you do for the Lord will fade away. You have a purpose for your life. And this grace that God gives you in Jesus, it can't be erased either. Uh, your sins can't erase it. Your own greed, your own uh, your anger, your, your lies, your selfishness, your materialism, none of it. Your sin can never erase uh, what God has done because of the resurrection of Jesus. And your hope in Christ, it can't be erased because it's sealed by the resurrection Nothing in this world, no, no circumstances, no pain, no suffering can take away the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So that's why we celebrate today. We're not just remembering some event that happened years ago. This is not just a tradition. This is not just ritual. We celebrate today because what happened on that day, back on Easter, it changes everything for us. It gives us the power then that brought Jesus back from the dead. We find purpose then, we find hope, and we receive God's grace. It's available to everyone today who would receive it. Now, if you have never received, if you've never applied what God has done in Jesus' death and in his resurrection to your life, then uh, know that God has made it as easy as A, B, C, and D. For those of us who've received it, then as I mentioned, these things, uh, celebrate the, the, these stages, these uh, events in your life that have given you uh, eternal life then in Jesus. So A, admit then that you've sinned and your sin separates you from God. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. It tells us, for all have sinned, all of us, and fall short of the glory of God. So God asks us that we humbly admit that we're sinners that we've sinned against him, that we're not worthy of heaven on our own, that we need then forgiveness. Then B uh, is for believe. Believe in Jesus as your Savior. Look at John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Put your belief, put your faith, put your trust in Jesus' death on the cross for you and his resurrection from the dead to save you from your sins. So A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is your Savior. And then C, confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10 tells us, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus asks that you confess him publicly, that you would do it unashamedly, and that you would pledge your allegiance to him. Matthew chapter 10 tells us, whoever acknowledges me, Jesus said before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. It's literally as if Jesus will say that uh, he is with me, she is with me, that what uh, uh, they needed to pay for in their lives, I've done it for them, that I've got your back. So we admit that we're sinners, we believe in Jesus as our Savior, we confess him publicly, and then D, we demonstrate our allegiance to Jesus by being obedient to God's command of repenting of our sin and being baptized into Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 2. Here is the first time that this offer of a, this gift of salvation in Jesus was then uh, displayed or given to the people. The offer was being presented to them. This is the words of the apostle Peter to that first crowd that had ever had that offer. And he said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance means that I'm changing from living my life my way to turning now to live my life God's way, his way. I'm wanting to follow Jesus now. Not going to be perfect, but that's the way I want to live my life now. And allowing yourself to be baptized connects you to Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. That Jesus is the example for this. Jesus went to his cousin John. He said, I need for you to baptize me. John said, I can't even untie the sandals of your, uh, the, the laces of your sandals. And Jesus said, no, this is the right thing to do, John. You baptize me. And then as Jesus done his, does his work for, for mankind, before he ascends then back to heaven, he tells the church, you go and you make disciples of all nations. I want you to do two things. I want you to baptize them. Name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I also want you to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So in our baptism, it also it helps to give us this dividing line between our old life and now our new life that we have in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 3. Excuse me, chapter 6 and verse 3, where we're told, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That's the cross. We, and, and that's the blood of Jesus. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, a saved life now with him. Verse 5, for if we have been, <coughs> excuse me, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we cer will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like him. And so our baptism, it unites us then to the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross and also then his work in his resurrection. You become a follower now of Jesus and you're on your way uh, to heaven. And listen to these words now of Jesus. John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
So don't let your hearts be troubled this Easter. Trust in God. Remember, because of Easter, nothing is going to happen to you uh, or uh, this Easter or, or any day that you and Jesus can't handle together. Focus your hope then in heaven every day and know there is a room being prepared for you and trust that you're, you're going to go there. You're going to make it to heaven because of what Christ has done, not because of your goodness, but because you, of your following then after Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Happy Easter, everyone. May God's grace and his peace surround you uh, and your family uh, this Easter. And let us know if you're making your first decision then to follow after Christ. We would love to help you in that. And now as, uh, as Kyle brings us a um, communion meditation and a prayer, uh, you stay tuned uh, for that. And I'll see you next week. This day, Resurrection Sunday, was made possible only by what Jesus went through on Good Friday. Here's the good news, though, is both days are true for us all the time. And in these moments of communion, we remember Christ's sacrifice, his broken body, his shed blood, represented in bread and juice. I'd like us to consider a part of Christ's pre-broken and pre-resurrected body for a minute this morning, namely his eyes. Being both fully human and fully divine, Jesus' eyes worked just like ours do, but he no doubt used them in ways we do not. His eyes saw what others saw, but from a heavenly perspective. He saw and sees what's below the surface, our hearts. When all others saw was a sinful woman worthy of being condemned, Jesus saw a woman whom he loved and who needed grace, and he lovingly called her to repent. When a wealthy young ruler saw his own righteousness, Mark 10, 21 says that Jesus looked at him and loved him and called the young man even closer to his heart. When others looked at Peter, they likely saw a loud-mouthed fisherman, but Jesus saw a man who would become a rock. At his last Passover supper, Jesus looked at the simple bread and wine and saw a representation of his own sacrificial death. His eyes looked with pity and compassion on those who played a part in his arrest, beating, and cruel death. Those characters being Judas, the soldiers, Pilate, even the fickle crowd. His eyes were filled with the same pity and compassion when he looked into Peter's eyes following his three denials of Jesus. And his eyes were filled with tenderness as he looked down from the cross at his mother and his friend John. Still, Jesus' eyes saw far beyond the darkness of Calvary to what his death and resurrection would accomplish for those who choose to see things his way and follow him. Let's let Hebrews 12 verse 2 remind us of this. It says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you took notice of us and that you see what we really need and you see far beyond um, what we can see. Lord, thank you that you looked beyond Adam and Eve, beyond our sin, and you saw uh, what was needed and that you went ahead and provided the sacrificial lamb and saw fit to raise him from the dead three days later, which we uh, remember and we celebrate this morning. Uh, Lord, even as our churches are empty, 
Lord, we th- are thankful that the tomb is empty. And uh, even as we are a part, Lord, we are still the church because of what you've done, because of the actions that you have taken. Lord, help us to find great hope and strengthen that. Help us to find new ways to uh, be on mission for you and to connect with one another, um, even though it is different being apart, Lord. Uh, your power remains the same. Your vision for your church has never wavered. And uh, Lord, we continue to uh, seek you out. We continue to seek uh, your face and how to move about in this in this crisis. Lord, we continue to ask that you uh, move in the medical community, uh, among our nation's leaders, uh, among our schools, among our uh, so many that are affected. Uh, Lord, we continue to look to you. And uh, we know that you'll be praised and you'll be glorified no matter what uh, comes our way. Thank you for loving us. Uh, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection, which we are uh, celebrating together today. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray.